Hello. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me. It's, it's such a pleasure to be with you, a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, I spent earlier in the day uh, touring around the area a little bit and had the pleasure of, of visiting Sir Winston Churchill's grave, which as you know is, is close to here. I've long admired him for his grit and his wit, but also for his undying determination in fighting tyranny. And it was such a pleasure to, to, to visit his grave today and to see the flowers there and a note from a, a young boy, eight years old, I think his name was Douglas, thanking him for his, for his fight during World War II and for the effect it had in defending freedom in Europe. Today I'd, I'd like to, to talk a little bit about something that I see as a, a new menace that Western democracy faces. I'd like to share these thoughts with you, the generation of today, and tomorrow in hopes that I can um, convince you, yes, of this, of this matter, but also to rally and encourage our resolve against it. At its most fundamental level, it's not a particular country or an epidemic or a terrorist organization. The danger I speak of is a deepening erosion of our commitment to democracy and to human liberty. And it's affecting our younger generations more than others. Recent research by Yasha Monk shows that two-thirds of older Americans believe that living in a democracy is, a, an, essential, is an essential situation. But less than one-third of American millennials agree. And one in six Americans now think that military rule is a good idea. That's over triple the amount that thought the same only 20 years ago. And in Germany, France, and Britain, and other European democratic bastions, preference for strongmen leaders in place of elections is growing at a staggering rate. Faith in democracy seems to be flagging everywhere. I believe it's this era's most serious threat to the West. But if the free world is to regain its initiative and thrive again, your generation will be essential in fortifying its structures and raising its gaze once again. I suspect that this crisis of confidence in democracy has a lot to do with the perception that it's failing to meet modern challenges. Economic insecurity and opportunity in a time of tremendous technological dynamism and economic displacement, climate change, record migrant and refugee flows, information security in the era of big data and online networks, the resurgence of ethno-nationalism. These are real challenges, but we must know two things. First, our worst challenges will never be sustainably cured without honoring the natural liberty that is innate to our being. And secondly, natural liberty demands self-government, some form of democracy broadly defined. I say that with confidence because I've witnessed firsthand the power of freedom in the human soul. About two decades ago, when I wasn't much older than you, I volunteered to work with refugees while I was living in Jordan studying Arabic. I did that on behalf of the United Nations. I saw desperate, determined people fleeing oppression in Syria, Iraq, and elsewhere around the Middle East and Africa. But young one, man, young, one young man in particular stood out to me and made an impression that has lasted for nearly two decades. He was a university student like you, but he was born to a Shia family in Iraq where the dictatorial regime in, uh, abused members of his faith and members of his community in the southern region of that country. And I would like to tell you more, a, little, a little more about him and his, his experience. I'll call him Ahmed for the sake of his privacy. When he was about 14 years old, Ahmed was playing with some friends in the market, as was normal then. And at a time when regime forces were conducting mass arrests of the boys and men in the area, it was his uh, bad luck one day to be caught up in one of those mass arrests. And so he was taken with a large group of men and boys to a prison for no justifiable reason. And there they were beaten and tortured, and some of them killed. The regime's goal was to inspire such fear in their hearts that they would never rise in defense of their natural rights. 
It's the kind of desperate tactic that reveals just how weak, fearful, and inherently illegitimate dictators really are. In prison, regime guards tortured Ahmed, and they demanded that he and others pledge their allegiance to them and to the regime. In those horrific, bleak moments, Ahmed, like many of the others, told the prison guards what they wanted to hear. But eventually he was lucky. Ahmed was released and returned home to his family, where he began to recover. In the years that followed, he avoided further arrests, and he pursued his studies, even as regime rockets and mortars and other forms of violent attack and oppression rained down on his family in town. In spite of it all, Ahmed dreamed of becoming an electrical engineer, and eventually he began studying for that in university. But the persecution of his community in southern Iraq continued, and in his second year, Ahmed could no longer ignore the knowledge swelling within him that he was free, that he was entitled to certain basic rights by virtue of his humanity. So one night, Ahmed and two of his friends created hundreds of handwritten leaflets calling for a new government that would respect the rights of all Iraqis. The next day, they secretly distributed these leaflets around campus to ensure that as many students as possible would see them. And many did. The response from faculty, loyal to the regime, was swift. Teachers and administrators tore the school apart, gathering as many of the leaflets as they could as they sought to prevent more students from seeing them. A day later, the authorities arrived and they came to investigate to see who was responsible. Before too long, Ahmed realized that both of his friends were no longer at school. He knew exactly what that meant. They were likely already being tortured and pressured to reveal his identity as well. With no other choice, he immediately fled and went into hiding, moving around the country, never going out during the day, never staying in the same place for more than a week. He heard from friends that the police were searching for him, so he stayed on the move for months. Eventually, Ahmed's family was able to gather enough money to bribe a regime official to obtain a passport. And that wasn't easy given their persecuted status and the authorities' hunt for Ahmed. But he said goodbye to his family and slipped into Iraq's western desert and across the border to safety in Jordan. There he struggled to make a living and to advocate for change in Iraq. After he was finally granted refugee status and completed a long security investigation, Ahmed was resettled to America, where he sold used cars and made pizzas and did anything he could to make a living. It was not glamorous. It wasn't electrical engineering. But no matter what he did with his life in America, he knew that he was free doing it, a feeling that he had longed for and one that he never stops cherishing now. As much as his life is a story of oppression, it is much more a story of the inherent liberty of the human mind and spirit. Today, Ahmed is married with children and trains U.S. soldiers for counterterrorism missions in the Middle East. When Ahmed was in Iraq, the authorities could capture, chain, and beat his body. They could even convince him in the moment to voice support for the regime. But they could not have his mind. In fact, the more they abused him, the more resolved Ahmed was, even at age 14, to resist their oppression. Ultimately, he risked everything, his health, his family, his life, for the actualization of his freedom. What I saw in Ahmed when we finally met in Jordan was something I've seen flicker in the eyes of thousands of others in the Middle East, Asia, Africa, in Europe, even in places where they have little say in their government or how they live. That people know they're free despite never being told, despite being born into captivity, is proof that liberty is not a construct, but a natural state of humankind. It is innate and cannot be extinguished, 
even by force. And yet some of us who have inherited the free world by birth, who have never known anything else, now question the value of Western democracy, a system of government to design, designed to ensure our basic rights and to, give, and to give everyone their say. A bright young student in Texas, frustrated by his perception that democracy is to blame for government dysfunction in America, recently told me that he and other students were convinced that a theocratic monarchy would make a better system. I guess that sounds pretty good as long as you are the dear leader. But we can't just dismiss and ignore these questions and challenges to self-government. It's important that we actually answer them and be honest with ourselves and humble about where improvements to democracy are needed. We should start by recognizing one truth. There is no perfect government because all government stems from fallible people like us. But that's exactly why it's dangerous to amass power in the hands of few. The possibility for abuse or even just extreme incompetence is too great. Even if that power is used in ways you support initially, it will inevitably be turned against you or against your interests. If you have no say in your government, you have no say in your life. And if you seek to keep others from having a voice, then you invite the exclusion of your own as well. Of course, with democracy, we will make mistakes, but we will always have the power to correct them. It may take a generation or more, but we'll have the opportunity to move humanity in a better direction towards a more just future. Democratic forms of government are the only systems that guarantee us this power. And yet, increasingly, we're surrounded by voices who would have us believe otherwise, who decry democracy as a failure and freedom a fantasy. But we shouldn't be fooled, nor should we believe that our future is predestined, that we've evolved beyond the dangers of tyranny. The flow of human history proves that liberty's eternal currents are often dammed up and rerouted by dictators, tyrants, and others who aspire to absolute power for themselves. To a dictator, nothing is more terrifying than democracy, an acknowledgement that they and we are entitled to the same basic freedoms. They cannot abide such a notion and must actively work to destroy and obscure evidence of, and knowledge of self-government's natural place. We're witnessing this aggression firsthand today. Vladimir Putin, who empowers himself by stealing from the Russian people, jailing and murdering those who protest, does not limit his abuses to within Russia's own borders. He's engaged in a global war on freedom. His campaign against self-determination contains elements of old world military conquest, as, the Ukraine, as Ukraine can attest. But its more novel forms rely on modern technology to exponentially increase the potency of old tools, namely illicit cash and disinformation. These are the foundations of his campaign to turn us against each other internally and to separate us from our most important allies internationally. These aren't just nuisances to be shrugged off. They're the cutting edge of modern warfare. Advances in technology have transformed tools of communication into potent weapons of mass deception intended to upend the ideals that have fueled our prosperity and kept the peace. Just as the machine gun changed the battlefield, forcing soldiers out of neat formations and into foxholes, so too has social media allowed disinformation to overwhelm our discord, discourse, filling the air with hatred bigotry and lies. We see the lies and the memes and the cries to battle in the streets, but we also share them, lending them credibility, spreading their message. We, the people of Western democratic societies, are both the targets and the tools of this new weaponry. It's not about spilling blood. It's about turning us against ourselves and against the interests of our own countries. We're all targets, the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, France, the EU, every powerful free society. The world's anti-democratic forces are crashing upon our shores 
and sweeping across the West. No detente or appeasement will spare us their menace. We must resolve to deter and defeat them together. In America, we're nearing our third election since the first signs of serious Kremlin attacks. Active measures, for, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with it, is a Russian intelligence term for the modern methods they use to weaken and disable our countries. Disinformation, hacking, botnets, covert political funding, and recruitment of government officials and their advisors. In just three years, we've uncovered the shocking details of Moscow's ongoing efforts to divide our country, to stoke hatred, and to deceive our people. But there's still so much we don't know. Many of Donald Trump's highest campaign officials, including his children, were in direct contact with Kremlin agents during and after his campaign. But what did the president know while he pushed Kremlin disinformation and covered for Russian hacking? He aggressively pursued so-called business favors from Putin in Moscow. Was there a, prid, a quid pro quo, either explicit or assumed? Is the President of the United States of America compromised to a foreign adversary and under its influence? If he isn't, it would be awfully hard to tell. America is just starting to wake up to this problem now, but those questions shouldn't be unfamiliar to the United Kingdom either. Love or hate Brexit? We now know that a similar Kremlin-backed online campaign targeted the UK in support of the Leave movement. Aaron Banks filtered more than eight million pounds to the Leave campaign through a series of shell corporations in several offshore, offshore secrecy jurisdictions while also pursuing favors from the Kremlin. If this sounds familiar, it's because it's a common Moscow tactic. Deniability and opacity are key. In addition to disinformation, Russian and other large-scale money laundering is another tool of our adversaries to corrupt our political systems. Some credible estimates, estimates indicate that Putin and his oligarchs have stashed half or more than that of Russia's wealth, which they've stolen from the Russian people, abroad in tax shelters and shell corporations. They funnel billions of dollars into Western real estate alone. The U.S. Treasury reports that nearly half, or one-third rather, of all high-end real estate deals done in the United States involve suspicious buyers, often hiding behind the shell corporations that thieving Russian plutocrats prefer. Some of this money is then diverted into political subversion at the Kremlin's behest. They pay inflated prices for flats in London, New York, and for Trump-branded properties in Florida. All that money is now coursing through the United States, the United Kingdom, and other Western democracies, enriching unscrupulous businesses and building Kremlin-friendly constituencies and political networks among us. What or whom is this money buying them? This broad corruption where cities, states, and public figures become reliant upon and therefore protective of illicit sources of cash isn't new, but the consequences are coming home to roost now, in America especially, where an icon of foreign financial corruption now sits in the Oval Office. Money laundered by anti-democratic forces is buying the silence and difference or complicity of our elected leaders. Who should be exposing and confronting these threats on our behalf? The deeper those financial tendrils the go, the more confident authoritarians feel in attacking our nations. The Kremlin's assassination of Russian dissidents here on UK soil, or the Saudi government's brutal murder of Jamal Khashoggi, show just how despotic regimes are willing to export their oppression when they believe that they've neutralized our political will to fight back. They're emboldened, knowing that there are always people like Aaron Banks, Paul Manafort, Nigel Farage, Steve Bannon, Donald Trump, and others in the United States, the United Kingdom, and elsewhere, who will barter the security and liberty of their countrymen for more wealth and power for themselves. In America, we're calling for a full investigation and transparency of President Trump's personal campaign 
and business ties to the Kremlin. The UK must do the same for anyone involved in filtering foreign money to the Leave campaign <clears throat> or knowingly facilitating Russian disinformation. Such people are owed due process under the law and it's possible that they've successfully skirted criminal wrongdoing. But the integrity of the democratic systems that protect our liberty require full public investigations. And if we find that our laws are insufficient to prevent this metastasizing corruption, then we must improve them. That will upset those who profit off the shadows, but it's a matter of the preservation of our sovereignty and freedom, and we must treat it extremely seriously. Dictators like Putin, Xi Jinping, Mohammed bin Salman want to plant the seeds of authoritarianism in the hearts of our lands. To do so, they need fertile ground cultivated by those who have lost faith in democracy or who are willing to sell it out. It takes many forms, but today it's most prevalent in the spread of populism and nationalism. Populism is a natural ally of, of authoritarian attacks on our elections and our principles. They work in tandem, which is why Putin is often celebrated by populist national, nationalist movements in the United States, in Italy, in France, Germany, and Hungary, and elsewhere. But why is populism on the rise in Western democracy? In part because the same social divisions and anxieties which authoritarians exploit internationally provide an easy path to power for opportunistic politicians and demagogues. Our, adversar our adversaries don't create these conditions, but they've become very, very good at exploiting them. Populism, nativism, and ethno-nationalism promise false security from the rapid, unprecedented changes in the modern world. Mass immigration and refugee crises, combined with terrorist violence in Europe, are driving xenophobia here, while demagoguery and fear-mongering fuel the same in America. Technology is displacing traditional industries and rendering some skills obsolete, even as it creates new opportunities for millions of workers. Foreign authoritarians love to exploit the anxieties that come from these vast changes. They do that to divide us. And the populists among us, they're all too happy to ride those divisions to power. Those people over there are to blame, they say. Let me punish them. Give me more power, they plead, and I will protect you. Ignore those courts, weaken that legislature, fire those investigators, and silence those journalists, and I alone will solve your problems. They claim personal strength and exceptional ability. All they need, they say, is a little more room to operate, or a national emergency, real or concocted, to clear the way. And that claim is appealing to some. We've all seen how slowly democracies can move. And we've all from time to time thought that perhaps the very systems upon which our governments rely might be standing in our way. But the more populists flail and fail, the more power they need. And the more others, especially immigrants and minorities are to blame and the less accountability they tolerate. So they demand that you trade the safeguards of your freedom for yet another false promise. But the populist bargain is never worth taking. Their promises flow like water, but their actions smash like sledgehammers against the foundation of our liberty. And in the end, their only answers are more fear, more hatred, and more unchecked power. Still, many people are enticed by that trade-off, by those promises, because too many of us, the stewards of democracy, have rested on our laurels rather than improving our systems and delivering real solutions to modern-day challenges. That's what's allowed the resurgence of populist nationalism, our inattentiveness to the maintenance of our own democracies and the growing societal problems which opportunistic politicians now exploit. In many cases, our challenges are different across the West, and our solutions will be as well. But there are three things we can do to collectively strengthen Western democracy. Firstly, we need to commit ourselves to pushing back 
against foreign authoritarian interference, corruption, and disinformation. That requires a whole-of-government and citizen approach to exposing their tactics to the light of day through investigations, to holding those involved accountable, and to countering propaganda with truth. We must update our laws to prevent foreign political financing, money laundering, and social media disinformation. Secondly, we, we need to shine a light on our own democratic processes, especially our elections. We're not perfect, and our quest to improve should never falter. In America, we must open up our elections so that more people can participate equally, either as candidates or voters, and so that voters are empowered with choices and better ways to express their preferences. Elected officials, therefore, rewarded for more unifying and effective leadership. But every country should consider its own reforms to improve its own self-governance. <coughs> Lastly, we must govern ourselves by facts, not fear. We must always, always be guided by truth. The polarization that's creating such dysfunction in our democracies is a byproduct of our fears and the lies which propagate them. Lies and fear work hand in hand. Where you find one, the other is sure to follow. That's why falsehood is the strongest weapon of the populists and the dictators. It, it ignores or it stokes anxiety and drives people to ex accept despotic solutions to fabricated, exaggerated, or even actual problems. But if we're willing to examine our own positions honestly, and with an eye towards evidence and facts, we'll find that there's actually ample common ground for real solutions that respect our liberty and provide for the common good. If we all do that, and if we all unite around our most basic human rights, then we can build a better world for ourselves and for those in whom freedom's fire still burns despite the heavy yoke of oppression on their shoulders. I am not afraid that people like Ahmed will stop recognizing their natural liberty. No power on earth can erase the indelible mark of freedom on our souls. But I do worry that we'll stop defending the fertile ground upon which freedom and humanity flourish. That's why we must fight against the encroaching jungle, the nasty, brutish state of nature that defines the world when we reject democratic order. It's a terrain hostile to human flourishing, where predators lurk unseen and humanity lives in constant fear and conflict. We must not allow the jungle to grow back in the place of Western democracy. Not us, not here. We must be the clearing in the forest from which freedom thrives and expands, and where the wolves and jackals, hidden in the darkness of the surrounding underbrush, dare not tread. We will hear their calls in the night. They should remind us of the danger that lurks beyond. But we should take courage and cut back the encroaching vines continually to clear a path for a freer, safer world. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Evan, for that incredibly emotive speech. So I wanted to touch on the themes that you drew on there. And you said that it's the adversaries of the ideals of democracy haven't created these conditions. Mm -hmm. But then what has created the conditions and where did these problems arise from? Well, I, I think that the conditions have been created by, as I mentioned in the speech, inattentiveness to improving our democracy. The world is changing around us. Uh, whether I think one of the most important changes is driven by technological advancement. You know, we're, the world is being, uh, the economic world is being um, uh, modified, uh, to put it uh, uh, mildly, very quickly. Industries are being disrupted uh, across the Western world. And because of that, there's a lot of economic anxiety out there, and that's not the only reason. Um, but we have systems at the same time that are failing right now to respond to these modern challenges. That's not the only change, though. Again, as I mentioned in my speech, you have 
record uh, migrant flows, you have climate change. The world is changing very quickly, but I think the economic disruption uh, fueled by technological advancement is, is most serious, along with, uh, with, in some cases, record migration flows. Um, and so we have to rise to those modern challenges, but our systems have not allowed that to happen, I think, and we have not reformed and improved our systems. What am I talking about? In the United States, I'm talking about electoral systems that incentivize leaders to offer more unifying and effective leadership uh, rather than appealing only to their bases, narrowly to their bases, and incentivizing divisive leadership that's geared towards only pleasing the voters of your own party, which is a large part of how we find ourselves in the current situation. Um, but that's, that's in, in America, which I can speak to the best, the incentive structure for politicians is to appeal mostly to one's base, to their party, not to provide unifying leadership. And, and that has everything to do with, in my view, the way we go about electing our leaders. And we also have you know, social challenges that we haven't fully coped with in the United States, of course, whether it's you know, uh, bigotry and racism and, and uh, other forms of exclusion uh, that are also often electoral. Um, those things make us weaker. And when our foreign adversaries see them, they exploit them. They point out that our democracy isn't perfect and therefore it's a sham and therefore it should be disrupted. Um, but that's why I'm, I'm pleading to, yes, push back against them, but let's, let's turn the microscope back on ourselves mm -hmm. and think about how we can change and improve our systems of self-government as well. So before we get to that point in looking at what we can do today to rectify <coughs> the problem, excuse me, what do you think over this gradual decline of the ideals of democracy, what do you think should have been done during that process at various points to prevent it before we even get to this stage? Well, I mean, so much comes to mind. I mean, as I mentioned in, in the speech, I think it's very important that we deal with uh, large scale foreign authoritarian money laundering. Right now, it's very easy for, um, for corrupt leaders abroad to steal from their countries and to send that money around the world through shell, co shell corporations. And what that does is it creates constituencies and networks inside the United States that are favorable to their interests and uh, unfavorable to the interests of our country and to the other countries of Western democracies. So we should have done something about that. And in fact, successive US presidents have seen this threat and tried to do something about it. Uh, but then very powerful, influential uh, lobbyists and, and corporations, uh, I think supporting the interests of, of some of these wealthy foreign actors uh, get in the way of those reforms. And, and we've been unable to, to make those changes, even, even as we've reformed other parts of our financial system. When it comes to, for example, real estate finance, we've not been able to do that. Or when you think about social media and how unregulated that space is still to this day, it's so unregulated here in the UK and in, in the United States. Uh, we're depending upon companies that uh, did not do enough to prevent the exploitation of their platforms uh, by, by foreign actors. Uh, that's a lesson learned too. We could, have been, we could have been ahead of that and we weren't. There's so many things. So I think the one thing that I was trying to get to is that, yeah. so there's, there's all these problems with foreign autocratic regimes, but I think a lot of this erosion of democratic ideals is when people feel an apathy towards the democratic process and working class people across America mm -hmm. have felt that in 2016 and that's what led to the situation we're in now. But those people aren't responding to money laundering from autocratic regimes. So what is it that most people across America who are now feeling these apathy towards democracy like that, those students in Texas you're talking about, what do you think it is that would have prevented those people from feeling what they do today? Yeah, well, again, I think it's, I think it's electoral systems. I mean, the, the number one change I think needs to be made is the way we elect our leaders. So right now, as the room knows well, we elect our leaders through a nominating process uh, from each party, and then there's a general election. In most cases, that's how it works. Uh, but, you know, there are some reforms taking place that I think 
would have changed the dynamic so that leaders were more incentivized to provide more unifying leadership. For example, ranked choice voting, which is a form of elections. I didn't want to get too much into it in my speech, but since you're asking, uh, a form of electoral process which allows you to rank the candidates as to your preference. And so then the, the, the system takes that into consideration in deciding who won. If there's an outright winner with the top choices of all the voters, then that person is the winner. If not, then you sort of you know, eliminate the, 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 the least, the, the, those who performed worst, and their votes, their second votes, go to other leaders. That's the way the state of Maine is now selecting their members of Congress. And so what is the effect of that if you're a candidate? It means that you have an incentive to talk to everyone, not just members of your own party, not just the base of your party, but you have the incentive if it's in a general election to make your case and to appeal to people on the other, on the other side of the aisle with the other party or independents if you're a member of one party or the other. But I think that reforms like that that change the incentive structures for leaders will change the way they campaign, will change the way they govern, and will lead to more unifying, effective governance. And I, I think you know, that's the kind of thing that we've been sort of stuck in you know, old ways of, of choosing our leaders. They should continue to be democratic, but there are many ways that, that we can make them better and that we can inspire better outcomes for the country. So now as we enter the primary process again, mm -hmm. and it seems as though now some people are aware of these problems and want to try and solve them, but there have been no systemic changes up until now. As we enter this primary process, do you have any hope that going before 2020, there might be any change and there might be any kind of rising of the consciousness to these problems? Yeah, look, I, I think there is a rising consciousness of, of these problems and, and even more so than that in the United States, growing energy around the need to reforms our, reform our political processes in some of the way, same ways I've been discussing here. I think there's a lot of energy around that, actually. And I expect that, especially as the Mueller investigation and the other investigations go forward and their findings become more public, I expect that that energy will continue to grow for a strengthening of our systems to make changes so that that kind of foreign interference and, and the leaders domestically who capitalize on it and facilitate it, so that won't happen again. So I'm, I'm confident about that and I'm, and I'm optimistic about it. I, and it's not to say that it won't take time, or it will take time and it, it won't fix everything before 2020, that's for sure. I mean, we're talking about a 10 to 20 year process, I think, to make certain reforms that need to be made. Another one is, is gerrymandering reform. Gerrymandering is sort of drawing the congressional districts, for example, in such a way that a certain party can never really lose that district. And so there's no cross-partisan competition, which is terrible for democracy. You can hardly call it democracy. But that's the way our system is in many places in the United States where very few congressional districts are competitive between the parties because they've been drawn to protect the parties that were in power when those lines were drawn. And that's something that has to be changed. There have to be independent commissions that decide how those lines are drawn so that there's more competition between the parties so that voters have more choices and so that we, we get, as I say, more unified and effective leadership. But you know, a lot of these changes are, they are happening. That's the good news. This isn't pie in the sky, it's happening. But it, in our system, it has to happen at the state by state level. And so it will take time. Then I think my final question before we open it out to the audience is, focusing on the Republican Party especially, mm -hmm. do you think there's any chance that even in a decade, they will be able to become more moderate and they can take the party back mm -hmm. from where it is now? Well, my hope is that that's certainly the case. I, I, you know, in the United States now, we're, we're still a two-party system. I would like to see that system opened up. But the way it is now, the way our rules are, the way everything's set up, we're a two-party system. And in a two-party system, a, one party can, can go completely off the rails and still have a chance of recovering. Uh, but I will say that, that I am deeply troubled with the direction and the state of the Republican Party. I've made no qualms about that. Uh, and, I, and I am skeptical that it, it can come back very quickly. 
I don't think that can happen. Uh, there were those of us inside the party who were trying to reform it for years and unsuccessfully. And there, there was a reason why we couldn't reform it. And the reason was that uh, there was a, a minority of the party that was Trumpist before Trump. And that, call it 30% of the party, made it very difficult to move the party forward to allow it to appeal to more women and minorities and to other faiths, not just Christians. Um, but we failed, and then Trump identified an opportunity to build on that 30% and to grow it to 47% and then beyond 50% and then to his current approval within the party, which is somewhere between 85 and 95%, depending on the day and the week and what's happening. But he's only made it more difficult for the party to reform. And so I am, I, I am hopeful that the party will be able to reform, but I think it will take some time and it will have to suffer, unfortunately for it, the political consequences of the direction that it has taken over the past, especially three years. And so with those political consequences, I hope is inspired a new approach. Um, but it, again, it will take time. And this isn't good for our country, I'll point out, and it's not good for the Democrats either. I think many on the Democratic side would would cheer this and would be excited for the, um, you know, for the difficulties that the Republicans are having and the, the lack of competitiveness that they'll, that they'll be able to provide. Um, but that will mean that the Democrats are, are um, unchecked and without competition, they'll make mistakes and be less effective and efficient in their governance. And that's not good for the country and it's not good for them. And so my hope is that we'll get back to a time where we have either two healthy parties who are committed to our values and our system of self-government, or that we'll have, more, we'll have a more open political process that allows independents to play a stronger role, uh, or third parties, what we, what we would call third parties now, for them to play an equal role and have a chance at competing as well. Thanks for that. Um, now let's open up questions to the audience. If you want to put your hands up and wait for the microphone uh, to be brought to you, is there a first question? Yeah, let's go ahead there. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I, uh, I actually voted for you in 2016. Oh, thank you. So, yeah, you're welcome. Um, but, I wish um, there were many million more of you. Uh, fair enough, yeah. If, there, if you saw a surge in Harris County, Texas, that was, okay. that was me. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, so my, my one was probably enough to account for that search. <laughs> <laughs> um, my my question is, uh, as you ran for president, as what you would describe as more of a long shot candidate in a two party system, mm -hmm. uh, what was your purpose in terms of uh, thinking? Okay, I'm going to run as an independent. Uh, what mm -hmm. did you hope to accomplish in the long run? Um, per perhaps beyond just name recognition and getting your ideas out there. If mm -hmm. you had a, a broader purpose, what what was it? Yeah, well, well, thank you for the question. I certainly did have a broader purpose, and, and it actually wasn't for name recognition. recognition. Uh, and it wasn't to get my ideas out there either. What I was doing was defending from the, the right side of the political spectrum, from the conservative side, values that are fundamental to our country and that were fundamental to the Republican Party and that I hope will be once again. That's what I was doing. My, my concern was that you know, I, I knew that um, that leaders with the power they have can lead constituencies away from ideas and ideas in political discourse and in the political ethos can evaporate and disappear. And I was worried about that within the Republican Party, especially and, and more broadly in our country, but especially within the Republican Party with Donald Trump representing the party in the general election. So my goal at the most basic fundamental level was to defend those ideas, to sort of be a, a Noah's Ark of, support, of sorts, of, of certain ideas that were essential for our country. And that, that was it. And you know, as I thought about whether I should run or not for, uh, you know, in a way that had little chance of electoral success, uh, I felt very confident that I would at least be able to do that, at least for a time have that effect. Uh, but the other reason why we did what we did, Mindy Finn and I and the team, um, was to prepare for the fight that we thought was coming after the election. And we were right that there was going to be a fight, but we were wrong about what that fight was going to be. 
what we thought the fight would be would be in the context of uh, Secretary Clinton's likely victory. That was the, the, the polling suggested that and most people assumed that would be the case. Um, but then something, and, and in that context, we expected to, to be a part of a fight for the heart and soul of the Republican Party. And, you know, the party was reaching out to us and leaders within the party towards the end of the race uh, when it looked like we might prevail in, in at least one state and, and that, the, uh, that, that Trump would lose, um, to talk to us about, you know, coming back together after the election to rebuild the party. And we were open to that although skeptical that it could be successful. But really what we got in, in Donald Trump's victory was a, a scenario that we hoped wouldn't be the case, but that we knew was possible. And that was one in which we needed to stand up to the then, the now president in defense of those same principles and in defense of Western democracy, in defense of American democracy. And so we founded an organization called Stand Up Republic which seeks to unite Americans from across the political spectrum around the defense of, of democracy in America, around the, the principles that we fought for during the campaign. That's what motivated us. Mm -hmm. uh, next question, yeah, to the hand just behind. Hi, thank you. Uh, my question to you is, could you give uh, any examples of politicians or instances where politicians have been doing a good job of bringing people together and kind of developing the, the unity that you're seeking? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, there are examples of, of that happening. Um, you know, the Republicans and the Democrats and President Trump, in fairness to all of them, just advanced uh, criminal justice reform which was something that I, I thought was important. And there, there's more work that needs to be done on that. Um, but it does happen. It just, you know, and there are lots of little issues that are decided on a bipartisan basis. Uh, but when it comes to some of the biggest challenges facing our country today, we're really failing. Uh, when it comes to dealing with disinformation that is ongoing, when it comes to dealing with some of the other problems I've described, but also just the challenges of our day. Uh, you know, the, the economic displacement that comes from technological innovation, which I think is one, you know, the technological innovation part of that is wonderful and it provides all kinds of new opportunities, um, but it also creates real hardship for certain people and in dealing with that challenge, we, we just haven't been too successful with it. Or climate change, obviously, we're not handling that either. And so, um, but there are plenty of, of examples in leaders who take a more unifying tone uh, I think Amy Klobuchar from the Democratic side, who has recently uh, entered the presidential race, and, and others on the Democratic side, Joe Biden, uh, Seth Moulton. Uh, on the Republican side, uh, Mayor, or, or Governor Hogan in, in uh, Maryland and Governor Baker in Massachusetts are two very popular Republican governors in states that are predominantly Democrat and democratic. And so, uh, so there are examples of this kind of unifying leadership. It just doesn't happen as much as it needs to in order for our country to defend itself against these foreign threats that I'm describing, but also just meet the modern challenges of the day. And that's why I keep coming back to these, the need to change our, our electoral processes to incentivize leaders to appeal more broadly than beyond simply their narrow base. Let's jump to another question. Uh, yeah, we'll go to the hand in the back and then to you, Matt. Right, okay, hi. Um, so you, you raised these two concepts which you broadly endorse, open democracy and unifying leadership. I'd like to ask whether you see a conflict between them at all. So for example, um, obviously you think uh, democracy is great, but there's discrepancies between all sorts of different types of democracies and absolute democracy is not an absolute good. Um, so, for example, uh, the US and the UK, the government systems we have are not very directly democratic. Um, and I think a lot of the issues with dissatisfaction with politics comes down to policy representation. I mean, I know you talked about consti constituency representation, but um, that's because in the UK and the US, we don't do a lot of direct self-determining 
Um, all we do is vote for people that make decisions for us. And so, um, and also not everybody votes on the basis of every issue. So like, for example, as I'm sure you know, California is a good example. They offer like a lot of referendums on a lot of different issues. My question then is like, how far you would go towards direct democracy? Um, you know, um, referendums would perhaps op offer the more direct, open democracy that you think is a good idea, but they are also incredibly divisive, as we know, and they are full of problems themselves. So I guess I wonder how far there's a conflict between these two things that you endorse. Yeah, well, you, you raise a lot of really important questions, and thank you for that. I, th I think I'll just clarify that I also see the, the pros and cons, the advantages and the disadvantages to direct democracy. And I, and I am not standing and sitting before you today advocating for that directly. I think, I think there's a lot to be said for representative democracy. And, and actually, I, I, I guess I favor that um, with also the opportunity for referenda and, and ballot measures that, like we have in the United States. Uh, but I think we should be um, aware of the pros and cons of each. Uh, but also more importantly, and I'm sort of, I'm, I'm saying that each country needs to make its own decisions about what's best for it on, and on which issue. Um, but what I'm saying is something more basic and that's just, let's decide ourselves and let's make sure that we don't have foreign adversaries pumping money into campaigns or launching massive disinformation campaigns on social networks. I'm saying that whatever systems we choose, however we shape our democratic forms of self-governance broadly defined, let's make sure that it's us that ultimately hold the power and that we have access to facts, to truth, to enable ourselves to make the best decisions possible. Um, but you, you correctly highlight the tensions that exist even within democracy broadly defined. And I think we just have to, we have to measure those as we go and, and make decisions for ourselves. And I don't think that there's you know, one simple answer or several even simple answers. I just think we, we have to decide on a case-by-case -case basis. So typically with referenda, it, uh, you know, it, it can come down to whether we do it that way or not in Western democracy, often depends on how sensitive the issue is and whether the people demand that their voice be heard directly through a direct vote rather than through representation. I think that's an appropriate way to handle it, but it, is also, it also comes with some dangers, especially at that point, especially when you have foreign adversaries intervening in that election, in that vote, because you remove those who are following the issue very closely as a part of their daily work, i.e. our representatives. You remove them from the equation. And so it's then all the more important that we make sure that these elections are our own, that how we vote on referenda is not influenced by the voter manipulation of, of, of foreign enemies who want to destroy us, not empower us. And then let's come to the hand to raise in front. Um, hello, you Hi. talked a lot about liberties and freedoms and more specifically issues in the US domestically, but as you know, in a day, in a, in a day of um, nationalism and populism, a lot of people see freedom and interpret liberty as liberty from international institutions. And you mentioned that you worked in the UN. So speaking from personal experience and as career advice perhaps to a room of aspiring politicians, no doubt. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that working in these institutions is something that's more worthwhile than ever and something worth um, investing our personal time and energy into? Wow. Good question, thank you. There are so many ways, good ways to make a difference in the world. Uh, whether you do it domestically in your own countries respectively or whether you do it with a multinational organization that is confronting some challenge together in a, in a collaborative way between countries. Um, but yes, I would, I would encourage that if that's, if that's your interest. I think you know, th there's, there's a, a role for, you know, there are certain things that countries need to do for themselves, but there are other things, many things, that we're best off doing 
uh, in partnerships and with our allies. And, uh, and, and I think that, you know, if an organization is committed to our fundamental values, uh, which you know, we share regardless of the exact forms of our democracies, if, if they're committed to our values and, and striving towards their actualization, then yes, absolutely, that's, that's a good thing to do, I think, and, and one that I would encourage. I was a volunteer with the United Nations. I was full-time, but I was just a volunteer, and that was long, long ago. Um, but I'll tell you that, that service in that capacity, especially in an area like that, dealing with refugees, taught me a lot about you know, the dangers of, of dictatorship and how they destabilize regions in the world. And, and that knowledge I carried with me to my service later on with the Central Intelligence Agency, serving my own government and my own country, um, rather than working in a multilateral sense uh, in the way that I was previously. Um, but, you know, those experiences are all valuable. And I think, you know, having one can help, uh, help you serve more effectively in other ways and going back to serve within your country. You may serve in some international capacity with a multilateral organization uh, for some time, maybe early on in your career after you finish here, and then you may come back and, and pursue office here. Uh, and I, and depending on what you do, uh, you might, you might, you're quite likely, I think, to find that that experience is valuable. I would especially, you know, I offer this unsolicited, and that is, you know, do the hardest things serve where no one else wants to serve. And if you do that, then you'll learn things that no one else learns. You'll know things that no one else knows and you'll be able to make a difference that no one else can, both in the present and in the future. Uh, but there are many ways to serve and, and, and yes, I, I think all of those are valid and, and worthwhile. And I think we've got time for one final question. So um, yeah, so we'll come to the hand there. <coughs> Um, you spoke about the electoral system when you were deciding whether to run or not for president. Um, did you think about the practical implications of where your votes might be coming from? Mm -hmm. And how important was that in your decision whether to run? Yes, uh, it was important. It was something I, I thought about uh, because, as I said on the campaign trail, I had uh, policy differences with uh, Secretary Clinton. And, and other things that I, I didn't, um, you know, that I didn't find compelling. But, uh, but with regard to Trump, I, I said over and over that I thought he was a danger to the country. And I was concerned about that. And so when I ran, I ran as a conservative and tried to make the case to my fellow conservatives that casting a vote for Donald Trump was not in the best interests of the country. And, and I, I ran with you know, policy positions that reflected my views and the views of conservatives. And our data show that actually most of the people who voted for me uh, were unfortunately um, you know, not necessarily moved from another candidate, but rather people who were simply going to sit out because they weren't going to vote for either of the two primary candidates. And so we gave someone, uh, we, you know, I tried to provide someone else an alternative for those conservatives. Uh, and that's what I did. Whereas some of the other independent or third party candidates, uh, I think appealed a lot to more, of, more voters on the left. And, and that was something that you know, I, I was concerned about during the race. And, and of course, after the race, we see the effects. Uh, but I'm also one who believes that there should be space in our elections for third party and independent candidates to, to run on equal footing. Uh, right now we face a true danger to the country and I think we need to be careful in this next election to unite around a, a more unifying, effective leader who can defeat the president. And my hope is that the Democrats will nominate a unifying, honorable, uh, you, candidate who's fit for the office, who can keep together a coalition that I think has formed, that, that my organization has worked to help solidify, which is a coalition, a coalition of Democrats, independents, 
and Republicans and conservatives who are opposed to Trumpism and who are in favor of a strong republic, of a strong democracy in America. That coalition is the one that needs to hold together in this next election. And so you know, we continue to have an eye towards those electoral dynamics and, and we'll work towards that end. Well, thank you very much for that. It's an incredibly and poignant note to end on. Um, but unfortunately, that is all we've got time for. So ladies and gentlemen, please do join with me in thanking Adam McMullen. <laughs>